book of Genesis is a collection of ancient stories written in a foreign language to a tribal people on the other side of the world. It is as different from our lives as we can imagine. When we open the book of Genesis, we are stepping into a different time and space where like serpents talk and men lived in 969 years and floods gush forth from the deep and God himself might just show up for dinner. This is unlike anything we've known or experienced, which can make it challenging when it comes to interpretation. So with that said, um, today we're going to be diving into Genesis 1 and 2, little bits of it, some key, key portions of that. Um, in order to prepare ourselves for that, I want to do an interpretive exercise. Now, I have to say, some of you have been around GVF long enough that you've experienced this. About half of you have. So if you have, don't ruin this for your neighbor, all right? The only instructions are this. I'm going to show you a series of pictures, and I want you to interpret them. So after you've studied them, I want you to turn to your neighbor and explain to them the meaning of these pictures. Ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah, okay, now we know. Okay, so a series of pictures. Uh, ready? Let's do this. Picture number one. Picture number two. Picture number three. Picture number four. And the final picture is this. So all I'm going to tell you is there is a place where people from all over the world flock to come reach up their hands and their feet to this sky. All right, turn to your neighbors and tell them what you think is going on in these pictures. All right, do you have a, do you have a, do you have a, do you want a clue? This is a, a famous site, famous landmark. It's a famous landmark in Italy. Yeah, so this is what they're doing, right? This is it right here. This one's so sweet, <laughs> but this has to be my favorite. Uh, uh, yeah, that's good. You gotta have some muscles to hold up a building. So what's the point? If you don't know the context, your interpretation likely says more about you than it says about the text you're interpreting. If you don't understand the context, if you can't see it from the right perspective, then it likely says more about you than the text you're studying. If you're not looking from the right perspective with the right cultural uh, context and cues, you might wildly misinterpret something, which brings us to Genesis. The stories of Genesis are ancient. Like, they were almost certainly ancient oral traditions before they were ever written down, so we don't even know how old they actually are. Now, it's believed, and there's good reason, that the time of Moses, traditionally, Moses himself wrote down most of these stories, although we know that it wasn't just Moses, because there are certain parts of the text that certainly go beyond Moses. For example, in Genesis, the book of Genesis, it mentions the city Dan. The city Dan did not exist until hundreds of years after Moses. So that's an example. So, but, but we think that primarily it was maybe written by Moses. For simplicity's sake, we can say, let's assume this is the tradition of Moses. Moses wrote the whole of Genesis more or less as we have it. Now let's talk about Moses. Moses does not live in Chester County. He's not from Wayne. He's not even from Kimberton, and he's certainly not from Spring City. <laughs> he's not... Not an American. He's not a Republican. He's not a Democrat. He's not even from the West. He doesn't speak English. He's never heard of the scientific method. So the Big Bang equals MC squared, evolutionary theory, the, the laws of thermodynamics. He's never heard any of these. A world of like cell phones and airplanes and MRIs and GPS and space travel and people walking around talking to a disembodied person. Siri, will you tell me? Alexa, will you? Like, that would be so bizarre to him. That would be magical. That would sound to him the way it sounds to us when we read about people talking to snakes. 
men living 969 years. Floods gushing forth. Do you understand? Our world is just as bizarre and magical to him as his world is bizarre and magical to us. Moses is a nomadic Bronze Age tribal chieftain. Moses is a nomadic Bronze Age tribal chieftain. Wrap your mind around that. So, so why is this important? Because we think in different categories, categories that Moses would not re- recognize. And we ask a set of questions that, frankly, Moses might not even think to ask. So the ancient Israelites and, and ancient Near Eastern people in general, so this would be Babylonians and Assyrians and Egyptians and everyone in ancient Mesopotamia, they did not have categories for what we would call random events. They did not think in terms of things just mechanistically or naturally happening. So if you ask a seventh grader today, uh, why did it rain on Friday? Well, if it's a smart seventh grader, they've had their science, they're going to be like, well, you know, barometric pressure was dropping in the jet stream, and there was this pressure, and something about the water cycle, and they'll go through all these different things. And to us, that would be like an excellent answer. In our world, that's a great answer, because we're trained from birth to give mechanistic answers to that type of thing. We're We're trained to explain exactly how scientifically something happens. But here's the deal. Moses would never have put up with that answer. Because the seventh grader, in his book, in his frame, didn't even answer the question. If you ask Moses, now why? Why did it rain on Friday? He'd be like, God opened up the window of heaven. God caused it. He is the why. So for the ancient Israelites, they attributed every rainstorm, every sunrise, every flower bloom, every snowfall, every birth, every death, every war, every famine, everything. To God, nothing ever just happened. There was no random. There was no natural. So we live in a scientific age in which um, we're brilliant at discovering how things work. We really are. Like we can say how, how stars are created, even though we've never actually seen it or been around for that. We can say how stars are created. We can say how the sun is hot. We can say um, uh, how the earth rotates around the sun and how cling, rain clouds form and how the sun shines and how this crazy thing, a sperm and an egg, can come together and form a person. Like, we can dissect the how and the what to unbelievable ends, but the why, the why, is a different type of question. Why implies purpose, meaning. Why exposes your presuppositions? Why reveals things that you believe and you can't argue from? Things that you believe, but at the end of the day, you can't explain why you believe it because it's your ultimate why. So science can and does um, answer many, many things, but it cannot and does not answer the question why. By definition, science is incapable of answering this question. And this is a big confusion in our world today. Science cannot tell you what is good. It cannot tell you about ultimate purpose. It cannot interpret meaning or value. It's like asking a calculator, like, what color should I paint this room? Or or using a tape measure to try and measure love. It doesn't measure that by definition. So here's the deal. Um, We live in a world that is utterly preoccupied with the what and the how. but, But the reality is we cannot live without why. So, um, a friend of mine, in his 90s, and this is a few years ago, his wife died after 45 years. And the man had been in, like, perfect health, right? But his wife died, and he died, like, six weeks later. Because he had no reason to live. You take away the why, you take away, literally, physically take away the ability to live, and for some people, they literally kill themselves. Without the why, life is unbearable. And yet our modern world is completely avoiding, systematically avoiding this question. 
politics, schools, corporations, we focus almost exclusively in the name of tolerance and separation of church and state and wanting everyone to be okay with whatever they believe. In that name, we systematically remove this question from our daily life. So you can have a a multi-billion dollar corporation sending hundreds of thousands of people to work every day, working really, really, really hard for years on end, building an empire, and no one, no one, no one ever stops to ask why our kids we send them to school for 12 years through public education 12 years and they they in to a good end they're learning all the what's and how's of the world every what and how you can imagine they're going to learn that but in that time no one ever once is even allowed to ask why now if you're really really wealthy some point You might be able to bribe your way into an elite school. (laughs) And maybe then you can take, as an elective, a philosophy course or a comparative religion course where they might start to frame out the why, but that will not be your major because there's no money in that. There's no money in why. There's only a reason to live. So this would horrify Moses, and maybe it should horrify us. But that's not my point. My point is that the ancient Israelites, Moses included, did not see life like this. They believed that true wisdom begins not in how, but in why. And with this perspective in mind, I want to hold up what is easily one of the most important statements in the Scriptures. Easily one of the most important. You are made in the image of God. The image of God. In, in, in Hebrew, it's just two simple words. Selim Elohim. Selim Elohim. This phrase has shaped the Western world as we know it. It colors and views how we view ourselves, how we view others. It explains why we as Americans um, value life, human life, my life, your life, the life of the severely disabled, the life of the elderly, all human life. It helps us find our place in the cosmos. It calls us to outrage, outrage, when we see people mistreated. It places a mantle of dignity and moral responsibility on our shoulders. It assumes, it is the assumed and often unmentioned why beneath like all of our moral decisions. It it is, um, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men, all people are created equal, or endowed by their creator with, with certain rights, right? Like life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, those things. So the, the very U.S. Constitution hints at this, is built upon this concept. Like to say that this concept is important is an understatement. Like this concept is the why behind life. It's the ground of our morality. It's how we view ourselves and other people. So today, I want to attempt to look at this phrase, and as much as possible, in the original ancient context, and as much as possible, try and set aside our modern scientific questions. So listen to me. I'm not saying that these are bad questions, like how did humanity come to be? Good question. And what is a human? Like what specifically, biologically, like is it our brain? Is it our opposable thumbs? Is it our laughter? What is it that's human? Those are good questions, but that's not the question I want to ask here. I want to sit in this and try and ask why. What if we hold this up and we ask, maybe Moses isn't trying to lead us to answer the what and how questions. If we ask, why did God make me? Why do I exist? Our text for today is Genesis 1 and part of Genesis 2. If you have a text, I would encourage you to turn there. Um, let me paint the scene. You probably know this context, but let's, let's recall what this is. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what we have over these next 24, 25 verses is this epic poem, this sweeping thing where, where you see day one, God's like separating and, and the, the, um, separates the light from the dark. And it was good. You've read this before. Yeah. Day two, he separates the waters above from the waters below. And it was, and then the day three, he separates the dry land from the waters. And it was and then he fills the separations, right? He starts filling those. So the first days, first three days are all about separation. The next three days, the next day he fills the, the light, the day with light. These l- great lights, the sun. 
And then he fills the night with lesser lights, the, the moon and stars, and it was good. And day five, he fills the skies and he fills the seas, and it was good. And day six, he fills the land with animals, and it was good. And each day, you just have this rhythm, as even, whether you even know Hebrew or not, right? In English, it has a rhythm. And God said, and it was, and it was good. And God said, and it was, and it was good. And then we get to verse 26, and it Something's missing. It, it, like the whole text stops. The rhythm breaks. And we read in verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps over the earth, the creepy crawly things. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea. And over the birds of the heavens. And over every living thing that moves on the ground. And he did this. And it was very good. Good, good in Hebrew. This becomes the epic, the pinnacle of creation. God creates man. Now, this text has always been challenging, always been challenging. So let's set aside what you know about it right now, and let's pretend like you go back in time, you're in ancient Mesopotamia, and like, oh, one of your, your goats gets out of the pen, and it goes over to the neighbor's house. So you're like, oh, I got to go get my goat. So you go over to your neighbor's house, and you're like, hey, how you doing? Oh, sorry, my goat's eating or whatever. And um, you start chatting it up, as you would do. And things suddenly go real deep. You're like, you know, do you ever go out under the night sky and look up and just say, why am I here? Why am I here? And he's like, yeah, that's so deep. Like, like wh why do you think we're here? And you say, you know, I believe, I believe God made us in his image. I believe that's why we're here. Do you know what would happen if you said that to your ancient Near Eastern friend? He would laugh in your face. He would think you are an overprivileged millennial. You think you're so special. You're a snowflake. Oh, it's so nice. Because, you know, back in the ancient Near East, there were people. There were people who, who, um, who were made in the image of God. But it wasn't you. It was guys like Pharaoh. Kings were made in the image of God. So Pharaoh, he built this. Yeah, what you build? Like a treehouse? Right? There were guys. This is Asher Banerpal. The man is choking a lion with his bare hands. You can't handle the neighborhood dog. Like, no. Made in the image of God. That's what it looks like to be made in the image of God in the ancient Near East. You, not so much. So, so when the ancient Israelites, these nomadic, impoverished sheep herders, came around and told everybody, we're made in the image of God. It looked bombastic and ridiculous. But here's the thing. So it wasn't just challenging to the outsiders, to the Babylonians, the Syrians, Egyptians. It wasn't just challenging to them. It was also challenging to, um, to the Israelites themselves. So if you had asked that, that your Babylonian friend, okay, so, uh, so you think I'm ridiculous for believing that we're made in the image of God, what do you believe he would have told you, well, you see, there was a war between um, Marduk and Tiamat, and after he took out his sword and slit Tiamat in half and created the heavens and earth, then, then what happened was is all the gods started complaining because the earth, there was so much work to be done. It was dirty, and there was all the stuff to cultivate and take care of, and they didn't want to do anything. So Marduk came up with an idea. He was like, remember that rebel god, King Yu? We're going to take him, we're going to kill him, and we're going to take his blood, and we're going to make these slaves, these savages, called humans. That's how humanity was created, to become a slave workforce for Marduk and the gods. In fact, um, here's a, a tablet from the Enuma Elish. You may have heard of it. It reads like this. This is Marduk speaking. He said, blood I will mass and cause bones to be. I love that he speaks like a caveman. I will establish a savage Man shall be his name. Verily, savage man I will create. He shall be charged with the service, the slavery of the gods, that the gods might be at ease. So, if you had asked your Babylonian neighbor, why, why did God create you? You'd say, see, you're a savage, made in the image of blood. Why did God create you? Because he needed a slave workforce. 
don't you feel so good about yourselves? So this phrase, this phrase is, is very, very challenging to an outsider, but to an insider, it's still challenging to the ancient Israelites because this word um, that we see in Hebrew, selim Elohim, selim is, um, is one of those words that is awkward for an ancient Israelite. And in fact, it's not used very often in, in the Old Testament. Um, this word selim, selim, selim that occurs in Genesis 26 and 27, um, saying that we are the selim Elohim, the image of God. This is, um, it's like inviting a vegan over for steaks. It's like when your wife asks you to go pick up feminine products. It's like being a Dallas fan at an Eagles game. It's awkward. It's weird. Like it doesn't work. This whole thing. So Selim can literally be translated idol. An idol of God. We, we can feel it if you translate it this way. It's the same text. Then God said, let us make man as our idol. Could be translated this way. So God created man as his own idol. As the idol of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This is the sense in which the ancient Israelites, if you know anything about ancient Israelites, you know this. We're Jews today. Thou shalt have no graven images. It's the second commandment out of the top ten. Like, don't do this. God cannot be made into an image. Don't create a statue. Don't worship that. God is the unseen God. No man can see God and live. And so this word selim, it might as well be a curse word. So whatever, whatever this word selim means, whatever it means to be made in the image of God, to be made an idol of God, we know, we know, we know when we read this from Moses' perspective, it cannot literally be true. We're not lit we don't literally physically look like God because God is spirit and truth. God cannot be seen. So whatever it is, it's this metaphor, it's this, this picture. So then, then this begs the question, if it's not literally true that we're made like God looks like us, that's not literally true, then, then why would Moses use such a terrible offensive term? It's offensive to outsiders, it's offensive to insiders. doesn't matter who you are, you're offended by this. Why would he pick this offensive term? So with that question just hanging out there, with this bit of context we immediately see that this, this phrase, image of God, is challenging and offensive. And this then leads us to a few clues that are in the text that explicitly and implicitly give us a sense of what this means. So what I want to do for the rest of the day is I, I want to show you um, six different things in this text, and we'll go quickly through them. So six things that we see in this text that point to us uh, what this means so that we can understand what does, when we hear this phrase, the Selim Elohim, the, the image of God, how does that answer the question to an ancient Israelite? How does that answer the question, why do I exist? Why did God make me? Good? So the first thing, like as you look through the text, the, the first thing, I'm not even going to point to a text because it's so obvious, is the word itself, image. The word itself is suggestive, that you are derivative you're a copy, you, you're a copy of the real thing, a picture, a reflection, a model, a statue. So why did God make you? And the most simple, basic answer that we can say from this without going any further is God made you to be a reflection of himself. Now, if we add a layer from the ancient Near East to this, we would say, but you are a reflection of God the way a statue of a king in the ancient Near East would be a reflection of the king. So when you entered into a certain kingdom, you would see the statue of the great king. You realize this is his territory. This is his rule under his law, his care. So this is the way you are supposed to reflect the image of God. That when creation itself, when others see you, they should say, this is the reign of a great king. His law is done here when they see you. The next word that I want you to pay attention to is dominion, dominion. Now this, uh, let's look at the text. It says, Genesis 1, 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over all the creepy crawly things, right? Dominion. Now dominion has um, an English a kind of negative connotation that isn't necessarily in the text. When you talk about humans dominating the earth, it sounds inherently evil, like the Patriots dominated the NFL. Inherently evil. 
So, so, but that's not what this means. Dominion here is, um, is it the word of a shepherd. It's a shepherd. It's a shepherding term. So you have dominion over creation the way a shepherd has dominion over his sheep. He cares for the well-being of the sheep. He doesn't want the sheep to be hurt. He goes after the sheep. He cares. For, he'll, a good shepherd will lay down his life for the sheep. You see, it's that care. Um, Walter Brugman, who's just a genius Old Testament scholar, uh, describes it this way. He says, the task of dominion does not have to do with exploitation and abuse. It does not have to do with exploitation and abuse. That's the opposite of the meaning of dominion. It has to do with securing the well-being of every other creature and bringing the promise of each to fruition. The human person is ordained over the rema- remainder of creation, but for its profit, well-being, and enhancement, the role of the human person is to see that creation becomes fully the creation that God willed. So why did God create you? So that you could fully bring creation to what it could be. So that you can take trees and plants and earth and rocks and you can make something spectacular. Something that exalts God. Something that is mind-blowing. And this is so much of what we're involved in today in the modern world in technology, right? So image, dominion, the next word is relationship. You are created for relationship. If you look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it says, So God created man in his own image, and the image of God who created him, male and female, he created them. This is, uh, I've gone over this a number of times in a number of contexts. If you go through our normal class, this is a core thing we teach about. So this is Hebrew parallelism here. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. That these two lines are basically, one completes the other. They're saying the same thing in a different way. So the image of God is not just in him individually. The image of God is seen in them. The very structure of this cries out that the image of God is not just in you, but in us. And so let's wrap our minds around this idea. Like if you want to see the God who exist as an eternal community, self-giving, loving, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you want to see that God, it cannot be seen. He cannot be seen fully in you. He can only be seen in us. So this is a fairly simple truth, but wrap our minds around this. So if I say, Ben, who did announcements today, if I say Ben is tall, that is a fact, (laughs) right? That, that's a, a singular fact, an individual characteristic. Whether, whether Ben feels tall or not, whether, um, whether other people are tall or not, has nothing to do with that. Ben's height is an objective fact. But if I say Ben is forgiving, well, that's something different. Ben can only be forgiving in the context of relationship. If Ben lives on a deserted island and knows no other people, He cannot be forgiving. We can say he has the potential to be forgiving, but forgiveness itself only exists in relationships. The image of God is like that. I can't see it on my own. I need you to see God. I need you to experience the love of God. I need you to know what life is about. I need you to know why I exist. And you need me. So why did God make you? He created you for self-giving, loving relationship. He created you for the, to have relationships like his relationship that's eternal. The next word is sonship. Sonship. If you fast forward to Genesis, a couple chapters, Genesis chapter 5, we read this in Genesis chapter 5. It says, this is the account of Adam's family line. When God created mankind, Adam, humanity, he made them in the image of uh, he made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them, and he named them mankind, Adam, when they were created. Verse three: When Adam had lived a hundred and thirty years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. So, so God says something about this image of God in the same way that. Adam, humanity, all of us together are made in the image of God. It's also true that a son can be in the image of his father. That This speaks in some way. How are we to reflect God? It has something to do with the way a father and son reflect one another. That kid, he kind of looks like me. 
He's got my eyes. He's got my nose. He's got my little baby ears. Like, that kid looks like me. He reflects me. The, the relationship between a father and a son can show the reflection, this idea of sonship. And this is, um, now, now, let me just say, this is true across genders. You could say um, the way parents are reflected in their children. You could say mother and son, mother and daughter. All of that is true. But there's something unique in the ancient Near East about sonship that, that we don't want to necessarily push that away because we don't, we don't want to miss that cultural cue here. Sonship implies in the ancient Near East more than just you look like your, your parents. Sonship, in fact, um, there, you can have sonship apart from g- biological sonship. You can have adoption that's sonship. Sonship is saying that you act like your father. You learn from your father. You do what your father does. You take on the father's business. You apprentice under your father that you are being groomed to run the family business. That's what sonship implies. That someday everything the father has will be given over to you so that you can do the work of the Father. Jesus says this quite clearly when he describes his relationship to his Father. He says, John chapter 5, 19, Truly I say to you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing. Because that's how Father-Son relationships work across the ancient Near East. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. So why did God create you? He created you to take over the family business. Like the work that he's doing, the creative work, the work of loving, the work of self-giving, the work of sacrifice, the work of humility, the work of elevating those and protecting those who can't protect themselves. That's the work that we're created to do. Sonship. Number five is this, to be honored. So look at this, Genesis uh, chapter 9, verse 6. It says, whoever sheds human blood, this is the time of Noah, whoever sheds human blood, by human shall their blood be shed, for in the image of God um, has God made mankind. So here, here's the idea. Humans, just any creature that has human blood in it, is a human, has great, great value, should be honored, has dignity, has God-given, inherent, just because they're human. They don't have to qualify for it. God says they have value. God says they are to be honored. That being made in the image of God has something to do with this inherent value and dignity. So why did God make you? Um, this gets into, uh, like if you go and like first year philosophy students, and sit around and say these types of questions, like why did God need to make anyone? Why didn't he, why, why make anyone at all, right? If he's perfectly happy up there. And some say like, did God make us to do his work? And the answer is no. God likes to work. He doesn't need us. Was he lonely? No. Was he bored? Like I've been waiting in eternity. No. Did he really want someone to worship him? Like, oh, I just need someone to worship me. I'm so depressed. No. So why why did God make us? And um, and this... This can be hard for us. To, I think this is coupled with the, the previous one, sonship. This might give us a better context. Like, um, h- how many of you in here, real question, how many of you have kids? Okay. Now, here's a question. Why? <laughs> what were you thinking? <laughs> like, why? <laughs> like, did, did, you, did you want your life to be, were you bored? Maybe you're bored and that's what caused it. But can I just tell you, having kids is a much less exciting life than not having kids, right? Were you lazy and you wanted someone to load the dishwasher? How's that working out for you? (laughs) Were you lonely? No, I had friends and then I had kids, right? (laughs) Were you hoping that they would worship you? Oh, teenage years. So no, none of those reasons. It doesn't make sense. Why would you have kids? Because you don't have kids. You don't have kids. A healthy person does not have kids to get from them, but it's to give to them. It's not not because you want to be honored. It's to give them dignity, to give them honor, to hand it to them. Do, Do you think God is so different? If he's a good, good father... I'm not saying that God doesn't deserve worship and our work and all that. 
I am saying that he doesn't need us at all. He didn't create us out of need. He didn't create us to get honor, but to give it. So here's the summary. What does it mean to be created in the image of God? When we ask this question, we ask the why, we come up with this list straight out of the text. We are created in his image to reflect him as kings, like kingship. We are a symbol of his kingship. We are created to be stewards or to have dominion over the earth that, that to take, a person's, um, to take away a person's work, their creative expression, is to dehumanize them. That's what we're created for, to make something great, do something great. We are created for community, for relationship. The isolation is terrible. You take a person out of context of other relationships and they lose the will to live. They lose the ability to live a healthy life. We're created for sonship, to take over the family business. We're created to be honored and reflect this back to God, that God is excited in us when we honor one another. And so this gives us kind of the, the picture of this thing, the image of God. But here's, here's where I keep getting hung up, because I've heard all of this before. I don't know about you, but I've heard this preached time and time again. But none of this answers the question, why didn't Moses just say all that? Why did he use this terrible phrase? This phrase is offensive to all your neighbors and to the ancient Israelites, both. Why in the world would he pick that phrase? Why didn't he say what he says in Exodus 19? You, uh, God made humans to be a kingdom of priests that they would be holy, that they would fill the earth. Like, he could have used all of that language. He uses it in other places. Why does he use this phrase in this context? And this is where we get something that I, just blows my mind. This is the Mesopotamian mouth opening or mouth washing ceremony. Um, you probably aren't familiar with it, but you're going to be. Um, if you want to look it up, there's the works of Dr. Sandra uh, Reichter. She, she's brilliant. Um, teaches at uh, Westmont College. Anyways, check that out on your own time. But here, here's, the, here's the question you're asking. So let's say you live in ancient Mesopotamia, and you want to make a, a Selim, a Selim Elohim. Now, this is not exclusive to the Israelites, right? This language is used all over ancient Mesopotamia. For at least a thousand years, we have this exact same language happening prior to the time of Moses, after the time of the Babylonian captivity. So there's over a thousand years across the region, all the way from down to Egypt, all the way up to, like, you think through uh, the Babylonians and the Persians and the Hittites prior to that, and all of those guys. They use this type of language in their own language, but they use this type of language to describe how do you make a god. Now, here's the question. How does a statue become a Selim Elohim? How does it go from just being an object to being a sacred object that embodies the, the God in it? All right? So, if you want to make an idol, the first thing you do, you can read this in Isaiah chapter 44. You chop down a tree or you find the right stone, you get your best craftsmen to do their thing, and they start chopping away at it to make this beautiful idol. And then they cover it in gold, usually adorn it with jewels. They craft it. That's what you do. You craft this piece of wood or this stone to make an idol. And that's great. At this point now, you have an idol. This is an actual idol from um, ancient Ugarit, by the way. Probably about 1300 BC. Um, so, so this is... Um, at this point, you have this statue, but that's all you have. And even the pagans know this. Like, even those who are outside of the ancient Israel, they know that's just a statue that you carved. How does that statue become a Selim Elohim? How does it become an embodiment of the God? And so they had this, this ceremony, as I already mentioned, the, the Mesopotamian mouth-opening ceremony that takes care of this. It was broadly practiced for over a thousand years. And here's the steps that you go through in this ceremony. Step one, you take the crafted object and you place it in a sacred garden, usually by a river or a canal, some body of water, but usually a river or canal. And then it has to be facing the east, facing where the sun's going to rise. Um, now, this reference, just to, to put it in an ancient Near Eastern context, gardens have, a lot of times, have a sexual reference um, implied in them. And I'm, like, so Song of Solomon, chapter 5, it says, I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. The man's not talking about horticulture. All right? So, and rivers, canals, had this imagery that is common in the ancient Near East of a birth canal. 
So you take this, this object into this sexually illicit place, this lush garden next to this river, and you place it towards the face, face it towards the sun. The next morning, the priests and craftsmen who are involved come out. They recognize the object that's facing the sun. The sun's glimmering off of it. And then they say, in ritual fashion, all of them, look what the gods have born. It's born. It's alive. And then they have a ceremony, the mouth-washing or mouth-opening ceremony, where they literally scrape out the mouth the same way a newborn child, right? You suction out the mouth, clean out the eyes and the ears, wash it off. They do the same thing to this thing, and they breathe. They open the mouth of the statue, and it's alive. Then they take this living statue, this statue that is now the embodiment of the born God. They take this statue, they install it in the temple, and now it is officially, they have to care for it because that's the job of an ancient Near Eastern person. They are the slaves of the gods, right? So they have to care for it. They have to bring up food and clothing. And they literally, they take it out on hunting trips and stuff like that because you have to serve the gods. They've installed the image of the god in the temple. It is now the full embodiment, living embodiment of the deity. That's what you did in the ancient Near East. So Genesis chapter 2. What does God do? plants a garden, a lush garden with rivers all over. It's in the east. Garden, rivers, east. And then it says, Genesis 2, starting in verse 7, then the Lord God crafted, same word that they would have used, crafted the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So it's crafted in the garden, in the east, next to the river, And then he blows into his mouth, opens his mouth, and the man became a living creature. It's alive! And the Lord God planted a garden in uh, a garden in the uh, in Eden in the east, and there he installed the man from whom he had formed. So he now installs the man in this in the Garden of Eden. I don't I I don't know how familiar you are. You've probably heard this over the last few weeks, though. It is a picture of a temple of God's presence, and and the temple of creation. So we see this picture that seems to directly parallel what's happening in the ancient Near Eastern world, that they would craft something, they would take it into a garden in the east, and they would place it next to a river, and then they would um, do their official thing to make it come alive. And it seems that, it seems that Genesis 2 seems to be following that exact same script, except it's completely inverted it completely inverted it. It seems to be saying, you think that through your own creativity you can make your own God. You think you can give yourself purpose and meaning. You think you're smart enough. You think you're strong enough. Brilliant enough. That you can create an everlasting meaning to your life. But you cannot. Only God can do that. And that can only be represented not in a dead thing, but in people in relationship with one another. The point of this seems to be you are the Selim Elohim. Let's put this in context. You are the image of God. You are, in the way that every ancient Near Eastern would have heard this, You are the embodied presence of God on earth. That if you want to see God, if you want to see his work, if you want to experience him, it's in us. So there's a lot of ways you can go with this. And I I hope you um, chew on this, that Hebrew word, haggah, meditate. I hope you haggah this text for the next few days and think about your ship and creation and stewardship and dominion and all sonship and I hope that becomes a rich basis for your life but I want to leave you with this cheery text from the New Testament it's one of the best worst teachings of Jesus it's in Matthew chapter 25 Matthew says that the or Jesus says at the end at the end of all time the king will sh- separate all people into sheep and goats right and left And the king will say to those on his right, 
Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Take what was always meant for you. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And then the righteous will ask, when? When did we see you? When did we hear you? When did we visit you? When did we feed you? We don't remember you at all. And he says, whatever you did for the least of these, I tell you, you did for me. Oh, but he's not done. Then he's going to say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And they will say, Lord, when? When did we see you? When, when were you around? When were you hungry? When were you naked? He says, whatever you didn't do for the least of these, you did not do for me. You missed me. And can I say there is no scientific measurement to measure the Jesusness in a person. There's no spectrometer that can allow us to see God in other people. But if we miss it, we miss everything. Let's pray. Father, I pray now as I started this message, I pray for that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. God, for those who are here today who need the encouragement, to need to know that they were created for something greater, need to know that you really love them, Lord, I pray that they would hear the words that we said at the beginning, that they are sons, that they're made to reflect you, that they're made for great things. And Lord, for those who, um, who are prideful or struggling or who... Um, who need a hard word, Lord, I pray that they would be broken by this. And God, we trust you with the results. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.